he was scared. The kind of scared that makes you feel as though you're going to vomit at any moment. But yet, he could not show it. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. To be absolutely terrified and not show it. He knew full well what to expect if he got caught. He shuddered at the thought of having to endure himself what he had witnessed being done to those helpless men. He loved his country. There was no doubt about that. His prayer was that they would win the war and all this would just stop. But what his fellow soldiers were doing to these prisoners was unconscionable. It was heinous and inhumane. He must do something, or he would be just like those men in the story that Jesus told. He would be no different than the priest or the Levi that just walked right by the dying, bleeding, wounded man on the Jericho Road. It was a story that he had read time and time again. He knew he was to be the Good Samaritan. He knew that as a believer in the Lord Jesus, he could not just idly stand by and watch these men die. But at what risk? His own life? One false move, one slip up, one unexpected search, and it would be him being tortured. It would be him dying of disease. And what of Matsuko, his beloved wife and his precious daughters? What would become of them? All this swirled in his mind as he entered the door of the prison camp. His knees were weak. His heart was beating out of his chest. It seemed with every step, the large, heavy work basket of various supplies, as well as the hidden medical bag filled with the desperately needed vials of diphtheria serum got heavier and heavier. Prisoners were dying by the dozens every day. Sickness and disease were rampant. But what if a guard stops him? What if he looks closely at the supplies? Kiyoshi breathed a prayer to God under his breath. Dear Lord, give me strength to calm down and complete this mission. I am Interpreter Kiyoshi Watanabe for the Imperial Japanese Army. But if I am discovered in what I am about to do, I will be tortured very extensively, used for bayonet practice, and then beheaded. The guard at the gate waved him on through the entrance to the prison camp without a second glance. Now onto his hut. He had to walk across the camp without drawing attention to himself. Japanese security guards were everywhere and had the authority to stop and search anyone at any time. He walked fast, but not too fast. And he constantly fought the urge to look back to see if anyone was watching him. But that would be a dead giveaway. Any moment, he just knew that there would be a shout from behind him to say, Hey, you there, stop. Where are you going with those supplies? Every pace brought him closer and closer to the hut. Yet the closer he got, the more tired his arms become, the heavier the basket seemed to be. He wasn't sure if he could hold it any longer. Finally, he entered his room, quickly removing the medical bag and sliding it out of view under his bed. A wave of relief forced him to collapse in a chair. This was the first of many occasions when the little man from Nanataki, willing rather to obey God than man, gave life-saving aid to his enemies. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. Kiyoshi Watanabe was born in 1890 and lived with his parents in the small town of Nanataki, Japan. Kiyoshi's father practically bankrupt his family in order to send Kiyoshi's older brother, Hidazi, to medical school in Tokyo. This didn't bother Kiyoshi because he was thrilled at the stories that Hidazi brought back from the big city every time he returned home for the holidays. It was on one of these occasions 
that Hadadzi brought home a gift for his little brother. It was a book, a strange book as he described it. He said, quote, It is called the Bible and is all about the Western religion called Christianity, end quote. As Kiyoshi made his way through the New Testament, he was intrigued. The man that it spoke of, Jesus Christ, was like no one of which he had ever heard. Some of the things that it said of him were beyond belief, but yet the book seemed to call to him as he continued to read it. As he finished the book, one phrase kept sounding in his mind again and again. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He could not understand it. It seemed to have a deep and significant meaning, but it was just out of reach. As a Buddhist, he was accustomed to sayings that were infused with meaning. These words of Jesus only retrieved more and more questions from his heart, questions for which he desperately needed an answer. But there were no Christians in his small village of Nataki to ask. Kyoshi would have to bottle up those questions about this strange religion until his path would cross another Christian. After finishing all the available courses of study in Nanataki in his teenage years, Kiyoshi asked his parents if he could move to the city of Kumamoto, 11 hours away, to continue his education under the condition that he would find employment to support himself. His father agreed. Upon arriving and after a great deal of searching, Kiyoshi found work in a doctor's office running errands and cleaning. Although his intent was, as he told his parents, to continue his education, he did have other motivations. It had now been a few years since he had received the Bible from his brother, and yet he wanted desperately to find someone who would explain its meanings. After writing his brother of how he tried one church and left even more confused than before, Hidazi directed him to a Lutheran pastor that he had met by the name of Yamauchi. Although Kiyoshi searched for and found this pastor, his intent was not to become a Christian. He was a Buddhist. His father was a Buddhist. His mother was a Buddhist. All he wanted were a few questions answered. But the more he met with the pastor, who was more than willing to answer his questions, the more and more he clung to the comfort which the Bible revealed. He found security and peace in its story of the forgiveness of sins. Deep affections grew for the man Jesus that willingly gave his life on the cross so that men might believe and be saved. It was at this time that Kiyoshi laid aside the centuries of his family's Buddhist belief and trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. Less than a year later, he realized the call of God on his life and entered a theological training. It would be five years of pastoral and seminary training before he would graduate and be appointed a pastor of a Lutheran church. It's interesting to note that Hidadzi, his brother, who by then was a practicing physician, would financially support Kiyoshi's training, while he himself would never embrace Christ. In 1915, Kiyoshi was appointed an associate pastor and then senior pastor at a Lutheran church in Omuda. Although Kiyoshi experienced the hesitancy and the uncertainty that comes with the role of Christian pastor, he knew that he had made the best decision of his life to follow Christ and that he was in the will of God. The care of ministry came quickly to Kiyoshi, and soon he found great delight in serving the people of his charge. As he served the Lord, he caught the eye of one of the young ladies of the church. And in a very short time, Kiyoshi knew that this was the woman that God had sent to be his wife. In 1916, Kiyoshi and Shigaru were married. Not long after, God blessed them with a little baby girl. Then a year later, a second baby girl was born, which was followed by the birth of their son, Shinya. These seven years in Omuda were some of the happiest of his life, serving the Lord as a pastor, side by side with the love of his life, watching his babies take their first steps and run and laugh and play. But 
tragedy soon struck the growing family. One evening, when Kiyoshi came from the church, he found his wife distraught over the sickness of the two girls. She feared the worst. Dysentery, a word that was nigh to a death sentence. For two days, Kiyoshi and Shigaru tended their sick daughters, wiping their brows, consoling them that they would be well again soon, while praying and begging God to turn the tide of sickness. But despite their prayers, the two girls died. Kiyoshi and Shigaru were devastated with grief. Little Shinya toddled around the house looking for his sisters, calling out to them, and was met with cold silence. Why, God? Why did this happen? Was it something in my life? What did I do wrong? These are the questions that Kiyoshi cried to God, questions that any parent who lost a child would ask. But this is also where the truth of God's Word and the faith that God instills in the heart of His children rises to the surface. Kiyoshi knew that God was too loving to be cruel and too wise to make a mistake. And he yielded to the sovereignty of an all-knowing, all-powerful God. He simply, as he would do many times, asked God to help him and to give him strength. Kiyoshi and Shigaru clung tightly together as they looked to God. And as difficult as these days had been, God comforted their hearts and gave them hope that they would have another child. And they did. A little girl named Miwa. And shortly after the birth of Miwa, Shigaru was expecting their fifth child. When Shigaru came to term, the labor in delivering the baby was long and difficult. But eventually, a beautiful baby boy was born. And they named the baby Shigawu. As joyous and wonderful as the occasion was, Kyoshi was concerned for Shigaru. She was not recovering from the birth as she had done before. She was becoming weaker and weaker. Although she smiled at Kyoshi every time their eyes met, he knew something was wrong. Nine days after the birth of their son, Shigaru closed her eyes in death. Grief overwhelmed Kyoshi. When his girls died years before, he had Shigaru to turn to. But now, there was not another to console him. It was then that he remembered the commitment that he had made when becoming a pastor, that he dedicated himself, body and soul, to Christ, and always to yield himself to the will of God. Although this encouraged him to trust God no matter what, he still had a huge dilemma. What is going to happen to Shigawu? In Japanese culture, for a man to tend to all the needs of a baby was considered a disgrace. That was the job of a woman. For a man to do such a thing would be a public shame. Most men in his position would simply turn the baby over to be adopted by another family. But Kiyoshi would not relinquish the last precious gift from his beloved wife. So he did what no Japanese man would do. He would tend to the child's needs himself. All the late nights, and the changing, and the feeding, and the holding were done by Kiyoshi, as well as seen to the duties of a father and a pastor. It was hard. And many times he felt as though he was not up to the task. But by God's grace, he was able to see Shigawu through that first year of infancy. During that year, he assumed a new pastorate in the city of Saga. This is where he met Mitsuko, a kindergarten teacher from his own town of Kumamoto. This common thread began to weave a relationship between the two. And to Kiyoshi's surprise, 
Mitsuko fell in love with him, despite the fact that he was a widower six years her senior with three small children. They were wed not too long after. Mitsuko took to the children immediately with a love that was indistinguishable from that of a natural mother. The children loved her in return much the same way. Kiyoshi loved them all and stood amazed at what God had done. In 1928, the ministry took Kiyoshi and his family to a large coastal town on the Akinata Sea along the Pacific Rim of Japan. These were great years of tranquility and happiness for the Watanabe family. Watching the boys grow up into young men, seeing the now big sister Miwa fuss over her two new baby sisters, Kiyoshi was standing once again in a place of contentment and happiness. In 1935, Kiyoshi received an invitation from his sister who had married an American and moved to the United States to study for two years at the Theological Seminary in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. During his early training in Kumamoto, many of the teachers spoke only English. It was kind of a sink or swim situation. So Kiyoshi had a working knowledge of English. He and Mitsuko agreed that this was the chance of a lifetime. Kiyoshi went and God blessed his time there gaining much-needed theological training and also a cultural exposure that God would use in years to come. Kiyoshi found the Americans to be no different than he in dedication and service to God. After two years, Kiyoshi returned home with a wealth of experience and education. Along with a nickname, a roommate hung on him out of the blue, a name that he was quite fond of, John Watanabe. When he arrived, he was thrilled to be with Mitsuko and his children, but he noticed that the Japan he once knew had changed greatly. The city had become hostile toward anything that bore the slightest resemblance to Western culture. It was only a matter of a few years that the social and political tide had turned to such a degree that his Christian church was forcibly shut down. It was an attempt to marginalize Christianity and to rid the country of what was seen to be Western practice. Kyoshi was forced out of the ministry and had to look for employment elsewhere. Because of his knowledge of the English language, he was hired in a neighboring town to teach English to schoolgirls. In late 1941, the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese plunged the country into war. Kiyoshi believed in the leadership of his nation and was glad that if there had to be a war, then his beloved country had made the first move. But he worried about his sons. Shinya and Shigawu were both young men now and were quickly caught up in the conflict as Japanese soldiers. Kiyoshi prayed daily for their protection. One day in 1942, a letter arrived at their home from the Japanese Department of War. It was addressed to Kiyoshi. Surely this was a mistake. By now, he was an old man, upwards of 50 years old. What would the army want with me, he asked. The letter stated that he was being conscripted to be part of a civilian regiment attached to the army for the purpose of being an interpreter. His grasp of the English language made Kiyoshi a valuable asset to his country. So with mixed feelings, Kiyoshi once again left a heartbroken Mitsuko and daughters to board a ship for Hong Kong. When he arrived in Hong Kong, there was a sense of pride in being a member of his nation's army, and he looked forward to the role that he would play in the war. He was assigned the Shamshi Po prison camp. When he got to the camp, whatever little excitement he had about participating in this war was quickly evaporated. The violence and cruelty with which these men were treated pained Kiyoshi to his core. Not long after entering the camp, he was thrust into an interrogation of a British soldier. 
the Japanese officer smashed the side of the man's face and mouth with his fist. He then questioned the soldier. When the response was not what he wanted to hear, the Japanese officer would backhand the man's face. This happened again and again and again. Then a belt was brought out. When a belt buckle across the man's chest caused him to scream in agony, Kiyoshi could take it no more. He ran into a washroom and cried out to his God for help. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me for my weakness and frailty. Forgive this man his cruelty, even as thou forgave the thief on the cross. Take me, unworthy and frail as I am, and do with me what you will. Make me a tool of thy goodness. Not my will, but thy will be done. In the days to come, Kiyoshi would not only see the hostile treatment of these men, but he also seen the absolute squalor of their existence. They lived in filth, malnourished, diseased, and exposed to the elements. Every day, bodies of soldiers would be carried out from among them. An outbreak of dysentery threatened to kill hundreds of them. Lice and vermin were inescapable. These men were cut off from the world helpless and hopeless. Kiyoshi could not believe the condition of these men. This brought him to a point of decision. Although he loved his country, he could not sit idle and do nothing while these atrocities were taking place. But to lend aid to these men would be a crime punishable by death. In his heart, he kept hearing the words of the Lord Jesus, As ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, Ye have done it unto me. He decided to let these words be his guide as he saw only to ease the condition of these diseased and dying men any way that he could. One day, he met a woman who was a wife and daughter of two of the men in the camp. Nellie Lee came to the camp begging to see her loved ones. Of course, her pleas fell on deaf ears, but Kiyoshi took note of her and decided to go to her home and see if he could be of any help. His encounter with Nellie and her three young daughters went well. He left there with messages to deliver to her husband and her father, and with a new nickname that would stick with him for the rest of his life, Uncle John Wontonaby. Although this at least was something he was doing to improve the condition of these prisoners to some degree, he still wanted to do more. Prisoners were dying daily of dysentery and diphtheria. Disease was spreading rapidly. Nellie soon connected John with a Dr. Selwyn Clark. He was a British doctor in Hong Kong who had somehow eluded internment when the Japanese took the Chinese city of Hong Kong. He and Dr. Clark put a plan into action to smuggle the desperately needed medical aid into the camp. One day, at Nellie Lee's home, Uncle John was met with a large cane work case filled with medical supplies and precious serums to treat the diseases killing these men. Although he feared for his life, he passed through the prison camp entry without hassle and went straight to his hut. Later that night, he took the supplies to a Dr. Ashton Rose, a prisoner of the camp trying to care for these men with little to no supplies. After nearly being caught by a night guard, he safely made it home. When he arrived at his hut, he collapsed in an emotional heap on his bed, ending with heaving sickness on the floor. Despite his terror that never seemed to diminish, Uncle John took the same life-threatening course again and again. And all the while, soldiers were all around him, and rumors were being passed throughout the camp that someone was helping the prisoners. Kiyoshi was the prime suspect. Everyone knew that he had been a Christian pastor and was the only Christian in the camp. He was hated and despised by everyone except the prisoners. And yet, miraculously, he was never caught. As he walked across the camp one day with a briefcase full of medicine, a sergeant new to the camp stopped him. With his hand resting on his samurai sword at his waist, he asked, "'That's a fine briefcase you're carrying.' What you got in it? Kyoshi was stunned. His heart raced so badly and his body shook so violently that he could say nothing but undiscernible sounds. Show me. Let me see it. 
Kiyoshi's shaking hands put forward the case. The sergeant snatched it. Fumbling with the latch, he asked, Heavy, isn't it? What's inside? Kiyoshi's mouth was locked in fear. The sergeant opened the case and peered in. Uncle John expected him to scream for the guards and shout, Here's the traitor! Arrest him! But nothing happened. He simply closed the case and walked away. Hours later, Kiyoshi expected guards to invade his hut at any moment. But nothing. Nothing happened. Nothing happened the following day or the next day. In Kiyoshi's mind, he was sure that this was a miracle. He told Nellie Lee that he had escaped because she and the girls were praying for him. These are things that happened to the small man from Nanataki time and time again as he reached out with compassion to these abused soldiers. People all around him who despised him and hated him knew that he was the one doing it, but they could never catch him. Camp commanders were furious at him and screamed at him. Fellow soldiers and interpreters would abuse him and threaten to kill him, and yet he kept right on obeying God rather than man. Over the next few years, he was transferred twice so that the Japanese captains could just get rid of him. In each new place, he found a way to bring help and healing to these dying prisoners. One day, while he was working in an office at Stanley Prison Camp, a prisoner was brought in that was due to be transferred to another camp. Uncle John did not recognize him at first. He was tall and emaciated, having a very scraggly beard covering his face. He was a sad specimen to look upon. But then familiarity began to set in. All of a sudden, he realized it was Dr. Selwyn Clark. During the time they'd worked together at Shamshi Po prison camp, they had become quite close. Uncle John had no idea that he had been captured and imprisoned. He immediately without thinking, ran over and grabbed the doctor's hand with tears beginning to flow out of his eyes. Dr. Selwyn Clark said, quote, My dear Uncle John, how good it is to see you again. End quote. Kiyoshi didn't know what to say. After a moment, they were parted. It was then that he realized that this whole scene was played out in front of the prison camp colonel. The colonel was furious. He had Uncle John brought into his office and then proceeded to go on a tirade. You make me feel contaminated, Wontanabe, he shouted. And I feel unclean just standing beside you. To call you a swine would be an insult to the pig. But you have reached the end of your road, Mr. Lutheran Minister, because now I know all about you. I have all the proof I need. You helped the doctor, didn't you? You betrayed Japan. Get your miserable belongings and get out of this camp. But leave your uniform here so I can burn it. Scum, leave my office. Kyoshi was in a daze. He started making his way to his room to gather his belongings. Word spread fast about what the colonel had said and done. As he walked through the camp, soldiers and workers slapped at him and hit him and even spat upon him. It was absolutely humiliating and frightening. He gathered his belongings and quickly left the camp. But he had nowhere to go, nothing to eat, no place to stay. Worse yet, the Japanese police would certainly be made aware of what he had done. At any moment, they would swoop down and take him and make him pay for his betrayal. Uncle John was running for his life. He was hated by his countrymen, hunted by the authorities. The Chinese people around him despised him, and he felt as though even God had forgotten him. It was then that he found a secret place and began to seek God in prayer. He cried out once again for God's help and strength. He prayed for his family that were in so many different places that God would protect them and keep them safe. By this time, the war was coming to an end. Allied forces were making bombing runs along the coastal cities of Japan. 
And although bombs were being dropped in other cities up and down the coast, Mitsuko knew that there had not been a bombing run to their rather large city. Only single raider planes, and then only twice in recent memory. But she knew that it was best to leave. It would only be a matter of time. She was waiting for clearance for her, Kimi, and Kia to be evacuated. Miwa, who was a midwife working with Adazi, came home to help her mother move. Uncle John was listening to the radio when he heard the name of his town mentioned. Something enormous had taken place. Something that had never happened before. Kiyoshi was shaken to his core when he had heard that an atomic bomb, the first of its kind, had been dropped on the coastal town that he and Mitsuko called home. Hiroshima. Later, it was confirmed in a letter from his daughter Kimi. On August the 6th, Kimi was arriving at the factory where she worked in a nearby town of Mukinada. Kia was in the city of Kure. Only Mitsuko and her stepdaughter Miwa were at home on Takashio Street in Hiroshima. They were killed instantly from the heat of the explosion, along with 80,000 others near Ground Zero. Kimi described trying to look for her mother in the city where nothing stood. They simply were nowhere to be found. At this news, Kiyoshi collapsed to the floor with grief. He was emotionally broken. His mind went back to the death of his two daughters, his beloved Shigaru, and now Mitsuko and Miwa. How much more could he take? For two days, he wrestled with his emotions and tried to pray and tried to find comfort from God. And as the days passed, God did give help to Uncle John. He found strength to accept that God does give and that God sometimes does take away. Quote, I am his creature. I must do his will. He has been good to me. And who am I to question his will? If Mitsuko had to die and Miwa with her, it was not for Kiyoshi Wantanabe to say why. End quote. His trust in God gave him strength to accept what had happened and to continue for many years after to help others in need in his war-torn country of Japan. Believers in Jesus Christ are not promised a life void of heartbreak and loss. We're not promised a life without fearful threatenings or deepest valleys of sorrow. But we are promised that we will never be alone and that God's strength stands ready to help us in the moment of need. For God has said, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Forgotten is now available on various podcasting apps such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Be sure to stop in at iTunes and leave a review. I also want to thank you. Without you, this podcast just simply would not exist. Thank you for listening.